Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode. Today I'm going to try and go into a little bit of detail in different ways than I've done in some of the previous videos on how the board layouts work. And one of the cool things we have here is Doug's done a lot of work on these ones that you get on his that are pre-built. This one's the, the Baseman F, Baseman 5F6A. And he's of course got this turbo board already laid out. And you can hear Max getting a drink here. Sorry, my dogs are making all kinds of background noise. Um, and you can see this actually mirrors very much what's up here. And this is the PDF file he has on his site. There's multiple pages. I'm starting at the last page because it's actually kind of the first thing you should do. I'm not going to be doing soldering more than anything. I'm just going to be talking about what I'm going to be doing and why I do it and how I do it. So here's his layout. One of the most important things here is there are, as you can see, little bars at different points along this. And then there's a little dotted line under as well. Those are either of the solid bars or above board connections you need to jumper. And then the dotted one is one that you should put underneath. So we would basically go through and take the time before we do any soldering and we need to go through and connect all of those bars exactly as they're there and then double check them. And you should also, I've shown before, do a little solder test to make sure that you're getting continuity from a turret to turret. Uh, try not to touch the actual wire itself because you want to make sure that the turret to turret connection is what's working, you know. You also have to be somewhat careful, for example, this is the first one doesn't have one, but the second one has a connection between the two, but that skips two, and then you have to skip two, and you have to make sure you get them all in the right locations. Another thing you can see on here is this 50KL. This is the bias pot, bias potentiometer, and you can kind of see the funny little step up there. That connects here as well, and that, you know, you'll put that in there, and I'll solder that in as well, and then you can see that underboard connection comes from out of it, and then over and down into this guy here. So... Effectively, you have to do that underboard connection because that's part of the biasing. You also have to jumper between this guy and here. You can see the little jumper there. So, you know, you have to go through and know all the basics of what's going to go where on the kind of out of the norm stuff, and you have to wire that part first. So always get your jumper connections together like these. Test them, make sure they're good. Use a small jumper wire. I showed that in the last video for the Gibson EH-185 where I jump a few to show you, but I just wanted to kind of see why and how I did this. This is the layout that's been designed for it. Generally, when you're trying to do a layout, you would start with a very beginning image here. Oops, that's a little too small. And from that, after you've figured out exactly every bit of how you're going to lay something out, and this is kind of an art form in itself, and as you've seen, I messed up on them a couple times. They're not easy. Uh, if you've seen my previous videos on the Vox uh, AC100 and on the EH25, I missed some subtle and important things on the builds because I didn't quite get the schematic to layout mapping done right. But in this case, Doug's done it for me, which is one of the nice things about this baseman build, is I will have that all there. So the theory would be you would take the time to do all this and you're jumpering them because you know the route of the signal as it goes through the different phases through here. Um, then you strip everything off except those and you'll get this last board like this that has all of that. So that's the first thing you do. Once that's done, then you go through the process of really understanding the circuit and the good thing is, is he's got this that you can look at for reference, but you can also, at any time if you're a little confused, he's also got the exact layout of the, of the entire schematic here as well. Uh, we showed that in the previous video, um, one or the first video. So here is um, the basic now of how you would go through and, and build this out. So to really kind of think this through, you, you can realize the input jack signal comes off here. There's a purple line that goes under the board, connects through a 33K resistor into grid 2 the grid connector two. The ground is three, comes to there, and the uh, anode, oops, uh, the anode, I think it was control L, hold on. The anode connection comes from here and down to here. So that is part of what you need to start learning and understanding when you see these is what each one is doing. And this is kind of triple rows of dealing with all three of those. Two different input jacks going to two different inputs, each half of this is getting it. He only shows two here, but in, in reality, the way you build it out is per this dual input jack setup. You have a low and a high input for each one. And uh, I, I'd like to possibly, in this video or another one, I'll kind of explain how this works, because this is kind of a cool thing that Fender came up with, where if you plug into one jack, you get a certain tone. You plug into the other jack, you get a slightly different tone, and it's kind of cool the way they did that. But at any rate, that's another topic for another day. So ultimately, you look and you see, okay, this is a 220 microfarad, uh, and it's a capacitor, but one of the nice things he's done here is if they're polarized, uh, they have this, let me zoom in a little bit, they have this plus on them, meaning that they are polarized, and then the ones that aren't will just usually look brown or in this kind of funny, odd, like, bumpy shape. And kind of the difference between the brown and the bumpy shape is also on purpose to help you kind of distinguish between these two types of capacitors. The bumpy types will be these ones, this, you know, the black or, or these, at least this funnier shape, and that's why they're bumpy. 
and then these brown ones more look like this. So you effectively can see though with each one which one goes where. So to start off with, if I was populating this board, I'd want to find the 220 microfarad at 35 volts capacitor. So you want to look at the capacitor. This one sure enough says 220 microfarad at 35 volts. I know that one is going to go right here. Whenever you see, I showed you on the last video as well, whenever you see a single or two on the same one, you could in theory do them the way that's done where you're flexing them inside. But to kind of for compactness, it's usually better to get whichever resistor it might be. And I'm not checking exactly and put the resistor on the bottom, kind of like that first. And then you put this this uh, capacitor on top because electrolytic capacitors every 10 to 15 years need replacing. Resistors, unless you blow them up, usually don't ever really die. So um, effectively, that is the process I go through. I just carefully look and figure out which capacitor goes there. Oh, so this is a 0 0.22. I'll look it up. I'll look and see. You know, oh, this one's a this one's a 0.1. You know, I look. You can read them on here, but it's also never a bad idea to bring your your uh, measuring device along with because you can also quickly. Uh, connect your capacitors or your resistors uh, and double check them. It's always a good idea. So this one is a 99 nanofarad or one, it's 0.1, uh, it's the 0.1 type you'll see like right there. So 0.1.1. Um, a nanofarad, uh, I might have to show this on the screen. It's always fun for me to remember. Uh, but a microfarad, uh, 100 nanofarads is a microfarad. No, that's not right. <laughs> I'll have to show it for you. I can never remember it off the top of my head. It's the metric system, but I can't remember me uh, nano versus pico versus micro, but I think it might be... I know that pico is the smallest, and you'll see a couple of these, like these 250 pico farads. I think 250 pico farad is 0.25 nano farads, and then 0.1 here, it actually means it's 0.1 micro farad, is actually 100 uh, nano farads. Uh, I'll have to... I'll, I'll, Oh, Mallory says hello to a neighbor. My dog uh, was barking at nobody. Um, so effectively, I will try and show a little comparison chart on the screen here to help you understand the differences between pico, nano, and micro. Uh, but always check these. Same, same thing when you're trying to figure out what your resistors are. They have the color bands, which is good, but it's always better to double check. Uh, this one is going to be 100 and... I think, I think brown is 1, black is 0, and then red would mean like K versus whatever versus whatever. You know, so that would be either 1K or 100K or 10K. Uh, I don't ever remember them. I have a chart downstairs when I'm working on these usually where I'm at. But it's also can never hurt you to quickly connect the jumpers and say, oh, yep, that's 0 0.9. That's uh, 0.9K or effectively this is going to round up to 1K. So if I look on my board, I'd say, oh, gee, where's a 1K resistor? Oh, I see one right here. That's probably this guy right here, the bias range one. So, you, you know, you, you effectively will start kind of being able to separate these out to where they go. You'll know the bigger ones generally are going to be your capacitors for, I mean, your resistors for the higher wattage. Um, so all of them, the higher wattage ones are these big, thick guys like this. And there's a four of those total. If you look on the screen, there's one, two, three, four, five I see here. Um... Oh, and I have five here. I can't count. One, two, three, four, five. So, uh, you know, there's a 4.7K that's down here, a 10K here, a 1K here, and then two 470 ohm uh, for the different stages. You'll just, uh, takes a little time to get used to knowing all this stuff. And effectively, another important part, you'll see that these, the A, the B, the C, and the D points, if we go back to this page, you can see those caps. And I've got the five caps. They're all 22 microfarad caps. Interestingly enough, I don't know why, I guess uh, Doug maybe had a, a new style Identical same company, Illinois, um, makes these. And uh, if you can see, this one and this one are different sized, but they are both 500 volt, 22 microfarad capacitors from Illinois. Uh, I don't know if it's that, I don't know, IC, I can't remember what the C stands for. It might be ceramics or capacitors or whatever, but Illinois is the company. Uh, but if you see, the size is different. And the only other major difference is this one's called 1.3 and this is 2.3. I don't know what that means, the same temperature rating. Everything else is the same. But you can see they're just a little bit fatter on these guys. Well, maybe they're the same, and this one's a little shorter. So I'm thinking I'll probably put the two longer ones down here at the A point, and then the remainder you know, elsewhere. Now, another thing about the basement build that I'm probably gonna try and do and see how it works out. Normally the caps are what they call a doghouse in a fender amp. So they'll be kind of up on the back side, and you would feed them back in, and you just bring wires over to these connection points from there, A, B, and C of the caps, over to the board here, A, B, and C. And if you look there at the A, B, and C, A is right here. So these two would connect here and their ground would be connecting to ground. 
Then we'd have another one that connects at B, which is just on the other side of the choke right here. And then we'd have another one that connects to C, which is going to be right, or would that be about, I think here, if I'm looking at the right spot. Yeah, right here. And then the final one at D over here. So effectively, the cool thing that the way Doug's got this set up, it's a little tight sometimes, but you can effectively put these right on the board, wire them in, and then just lift your ground off to a grounding bus that's running along with the, where these guys are, and that's what this is, is a grounding bus. So that's one of the things that I do. I've done it on my build so far. It works out for me very well because it allows them to be locked solid onto a turret and then locked solid onto a grounding bus that's not moving, and you don't have to have a special kind of out-of-the-way place for them, and they're just, they fit right in line in here. Uh, another thing that's great about this style of layout um, is that that you effectively get each of the tubes kind of just fits along here as you go. Uh, and as you can see, you know, we get all of these different tube connections that are really close to where they live. And so it reduces crosstalk. You don't accidentally cross things over. And that was one of the ones on my last build that I had a problem was is I accidentally kind of swapped that layout for my preamp tubes, which made it a little tricky. But uh, it worked. I just had to shield everything and be very careful with it. So that, uh, you know, I think that in a nutshell shows some of what you've already seen. I just carefully go through, take my time to measure each resistor, put it in. I showed you how to bend them and everything. But I just, you know, the, the great thing about having a nice layout like this is you can just go through and double check everything over and over again. And then I also showed uh, at the last video, once you get done with that, you print this off, you get your magic marker, and you mark off to double check that you've done everything the way that that asked you to. So... That's the, the video for today. I uh, hope that makes sense and that gives you a little bit of insight into how I do it. And I think that's the way pretty much most of the uh, other ant builders I've heard do it. Some of them do it in a little different order about how they... Some will do the board in the chassis first and start wiring. Others actually do everything else in the chassis and then bring the wiring... Bring this in with the wiring already on it and kind of finish it up. You know, there's a lot of little subtle tweaks you can do that way. But you still have to break it down to these subcomponents of populate the board, then connect the boards to the different, you know, the pots and the tube sockets and the inputs and all that jazz. So at any rate, we'll continue showing you on our next video about uh, when I start actually soldering this board and getting ready to put it down inside of the chassis. And then we'll start wiring into the chassis and then hopefully after that we'll have a bit of a demo. So uh, making good progress on it. Hope everybody enjoys it. Thanks. Keep your amps biased hot and keep the tunes coming.